Thank you for listening to the Providence Church Podcast. We're currently in a series called Heart and Soul, based on the book of Acts. If you're in the East Sacramento area, join us Sundays at 10.30 a.m. at Tahoe Elementary School. Now, let's go to this week's message. Father, we just thank you so much for your sovereign grace and mercy. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us an opportunity to make an intelligent decision to follow you. God, this world is looking for men and women that will follow you. Lord, I'm just thankful that you have given us such an opportunity this morning. I pray that you would be with us during this time. I pray that what I have to say will bless and edify the body. And also pray that for those that are in this place and listening perhaps later on down the road, that they would also be blessed to know that you love them and you truly are their favorite. And they're your favorite. So, God, we just give you praise, we give you honor, we give you glory, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, it's so awesome to be here. Um, First of all, I want to also acknowledge Pastor Josh and Lisa. Uh, Pastor Josh and Lisa have loved on our son from the time he barely had a mustache. And uh, and it came out of nowhere. Uh, we, we, We were... uh, at a very large church in this city um, and um, we transitioned to a to a not so large church but in that transition there was always the wonder and amazement of what would happen with our kids and once um, Sheridan got under Pastor Josh and Lisa's tutelage uh, he just soared and Josh saw things in him that few others even dare to even look for um, So I just want to publicly thank both Pastor Josh and Lisa. Can we give them a round of applause? Okay, so today I want to tell you a story. There's four components to my message, and I'll be very, very brief. It is we need to read the word, meditate on the word, read, meditate, apply, and share the word. Now, you have a special responsibility here in East Park, Tahoe Park, in that there are people that park their cars and then they walk down to the restaurant. And I see them, because you know, I'm a gregarious guy. I like to greet and love on people. So I was standing out front this morning and every time a person would walk up, I'd try to say hi to them. But there were a few people who parked their cars and I went and I watched them walk right by to the restaurant. And so that's a challenge for you, church. I mean, there is a, there is a, a thin line between the food for our natural bodies and the food for our spiritual bodies. Amen? Amen. 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 So today I'm going to be sharing from you from the book of Acts. Pastor Joshua is gracious enough to let me skip chapter 5, 6, and 7, and I'm starting at chapter 8, and it should be on the screen, hopefully. But um, I thought I'd ask my beautiful bride to read my portion. When I met my wife, first of all, my wife, Deborah, everybody. One of the things she said that got her when we met was that I told her we were a team. And when I told her that, she liked that. And so we're Team Smith, and uh, big team, right? And, but we are a team, and I thought I'd have her share the first passage before I break it down, if you don't mind. Before I share, I'm just so happy to be here. You guys are just awesome. Pastor Josh, Lisa, you guys are awesome. And I just have to share that um, the Lord hears and answers your prayers. And when I was pregnant with Sheridan, I didn't know what I was going to have. We had, a, we had a little girl, Cherie. And I asked the Lord, if you'll give me a son, I'll give him back to you. I prayed this when I was pregnant with him. And the Lord has answered my prayers. So I just want to give you guys hope. Pray expectantly. Pray for the Lord to answer your prayers, because he will. Okay? Acts, chapter 8, verse 26. Now the angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, 
an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading, Philip asked? How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Thank you, sweetie. Powerful story about evangelism in the Bible, about walking in the spirit and about obedience. Philip was just minding his own business. You know, he'd had a successful ministry in Samaria and had been just blessing people. But then God said, hey, go over there. And Philip didn't even question it like many of us do, like I do sometimes when God tells me to go somewhere. I'm like, why am I going there? Philip just went, and when he went, God showed him a man, an Ethiopian eunuch, sitting in a chariot. And he was reading, but he didn't understand what he was reading. So he asked him the question, as my wife just read, do you know what you're reading? And he said, how am I going to know unless someone tells me? So the first component of the four-point sermon that I have today is you have to read the, the Word of God. You have to read the Word of God for yourself. I challenge you. Providence Church to bring your Bibles with you when you come to church read it for yourself I know it's on the screen and that's a great convenience and I love that and I I, frankly I take advantage of it most of the time when I'm here But you have to be able to read it for yourself So I challenge you read the Word of God for yourself What we see here is that Philip Not only was he obedient He was called by God to go down a desert road alone If you read the word it will say that he literally went on a desert road all alone. Lately, I've been feeling like I'm on a desert road alone. See, what Pastor Josh and Lisa don't know is that after years and years of ministry and being associated and on staff at a church, my wife and I are in a season right now where we're not on a staff. And it's been interesting and humbling. Um, Every pastoral job that I ever received Uh, I didn't ask for. I was invited to someone ask me. And I learned a very valuable lesson with this last position that I had, and that is that when, when, when we pray to God to intercede on the behalf of other people, we have to make sure, and the men in my group have heard this, we have to make sure we're in the right standing with God ourselves first. Let me explain that a little further. I literally sat in a meeting and in meetings and in church on the front row where we were told that there were going to have to be some tough choices made, some decisions that would have to be made concerning the future of the church. They were economic decisions. Can you say paycheck, y'all? But in my mind and in my wife's mind, because we had taught growing kids God's way, because I was a men's, men's ministry leader, because I worked at, on the street with the homeless people because my wife was kind of a, uh, an advisor to, to the women's ministry, I, um, I actually kind of thought we were, dare I say, untouchable. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourself under God's mighty hand, and he will lift you up in due time. The problem with that, though, is if you don't humble yourself first, you can be shocked like we were. Because in that season, when they said, we're going to have to make some tough choices. I never thought it was going to be us. And I jokingly said this to the guys in our small group. As I sat there, I started interceding for all the other people that this was going to impact. Lord, help them. Help them. They need the jobs. And Father, just give them something to do and help them. And what I didn't know is that I was interceding for myself. So when you intercede for someone, you have to make sure that the first thing you do is to make sure you're okay with God and that your position with God is correct. Otherwise, what you find is that that humble yourself under God's mighty hand will smack you right in the face. Paul was, Peter was on, excuse me, Philip was on a, Paul, Peter, Paul, you know, wow. They all started with P. (laughs) Philip was on this desert road all by himself. And I feel like we're on that desert road right now. Um, Not all is lost. 
we got some great things going on in our lives. But being on the desert road, one of the things that I learned from that last story that I told you is that while I'm on the desert road, I'm not going to assume anything. I'm not going to assume anything. I'm just simply going to stay focused on what the Lord is doing. The other thing that my wife read in the Bible was that he went where God sent him. Sometimes we don't want to go where God sends us. We used to be with a very large church called Bayside of Granite Bay, and they were going to plant us in an area called Del Paso Heights at one time. We were going to be church planters. They were excited about it. We were excited about it. Just through a series of events, it never happened. But that's where God was sending us, and everybody around us told us we shouldn't do that. It wasn't a good idea. It wasn't for us. And as it stands out, it was not to be because it did not happen. But we were willing to go where God sent us. Are you willing to go where God sends you? If God is sending you to this community to love on the people in this community that are riding by on their bikes, that are walking their dogs, that are going to the restaurant, down the road, down the street, are you willing to go up to them and talk about the second component? We read it. That is meditating on the word. So when you read the word, you can't just read the word and check the box to say, I read the word. You have to literally be willing to meditate on it. The shortest verse in the Bible is John 11:35. It's Jesus wept. Two words. But when I was in Bible college, we had to do like a five-page essay on that one passage. We had to go deep. Because you got to know why Jesus wept. Not just that it's the shortest verse in the Bible. So are you willing to do that? Are you willing to go where he sends you? And are you willing to go at it alone? We know that we're supposed to be in fellowship with one another. But sometimes, even David, if you read in David, the accounts of David as a young man, there was a time when David was sat on a rock and had to encourage himself. So sometimes we have to be able to encourage ourselves. The other point that was in the scripture is that you may not understand what God says, but you have to go. You may not understand what God says, but you still have to go. So here's what it looks like. I knew a group of, uh, I knew a couple of young men years ago on fire for God and everything they did they it crossed the desk of Jesus by by their prayers meaning that they would pray before they did everything the problem with that is it sounds good on the surface they would pray before they did anything perpetual praise and continual prayer the problem was they were just checking the box prayer meaning they were in a radio shack and they were going to buy a little personal we'll just call it a cassette player that's how long ago it was <laughs> cassettes are these little things with tape on well anyway <laughs> thank god it wasn't an a-track right only two people in the room even know what an a-track is but anyway so they were going to buy this personal cassette and then one guy says hey shouldn't we pray about this they were pooling their resources shouldn't we pray about this and then the other guy goes, yeah. So what they do is they go in the corner of Radio Shack. I know it probably looked pretty weird. But they prayed about it, and then they went and bought it. Here's the message in that. We have to pray, and then we have to wait. We just can't make a decision to do something and pray, and then just do whatever we want to do. We have to have the courage to wait. So you pray about it, and then you wait. Amen, Sheridan? That's something I've been telling my son a long time. So you have to read the word of God, then you have to meditate on it. That means you have to think about it. You have to think about what it means. You may need to journal about it. You may need to go deeper with scripture. You have to really just meditate. You have to think about what God meant. You have to think about the intent of his word. You have to think about the context of his word. Too often as Christians, we take things out of context. We just grab something that we need for that moment. And if it makes us feel good, even if it's out of context, we use it. Here's an example. How many of you have heard people say, God helps those that help themselves? But that's not in the Bible. Did you know that? The Bible doesn't say God helps those that help themselves. How many of you have heard people say, um, money is the root of all evil? Well, you have to add a couple of words. The love of money is the root of all evil. Those are two examples of how if you don't meditate on the word and know what the word says, you can very easily go off track. 
And, and you can tell people that you're off track by saying that to them. And you know, God helps those that helps themselves. It sounds great, but it's not in the Bible. So by meditating on the word of God, you have to be able to understand what the word is saying. The third component, you have to read it, you have to meditate, you have to apply it. And there, here's where my, my brothers come into, into my mind. Um, we challenge each other in our small group to really, be, to really apply the word, to make the word applicable in our daily lives. We work in the marketplace, some of us are retired, but the bottom line is we try to apply it. And, and here's what applying it looks like. Applying it looks like doing an act of kindness for someone for no reason, not expecting anything back. Saying hello, saying thank you, saying you're welcome. Um, getting the door for somebody, even though we live in a society where, you know, it's frowned upon in some circles to even get the door. But to do little small things, applying the word of God, and applying it by your, having a personal character that reflects the holiness of Christ. Now, are we perfect men? By no means are we perfect, not even close. In fact, I know these guys, and I can tell you, they know I'm not perfect, and I know they're not perfect. And I think that's what makes our relationship so fantastic. They're laughing over there because they, they just discovered that they weren't perfect. But we have to be able to meditate on it and apply it. And then the fourth component is you have to be able to share it. And I, and I talked about that a little bit. I want to give you guys a quick story. If you turn with me to Acts chapter 12. And I made a note here to remind myself where I'm reading from. Okay, so I think I'm starting at 12. What's 12, 12, yeah. Yeah, hard to remember, 1212. Uh, so it says, when this had dawned on him, well, first let me set the story up. So Peter is locked in prison, and Herod had been killing Christians. And it was like, hooray, everybody was all excited that he was killing Christians. This, was, this became a source of their, like, Super Bowl or playoffs. So he was very excited to do Peter the next day. And I want you to read this for yourself. I'm going to give you the quick version before I get to the actual passage that I read. And that's the other thing. When people share, be able to go back and, and cross-check for yourself. Very important. But anyway, quick story. Peter's in prison. Angel of the Lord comes, freezes or puts the guards at ease or makes them freeze or whatever, spirit-wise. Peter wakes up and the chains fall off of him. And he's, he's surprised. He think, he's thinking he's seeing a vision. And God allows him to get up and to go to a house where people are praying for him. The Bible in some versions say they're earnestly praying for him. They're praying hard for, his, for, for Herod not to kill him, basically, in essence. So, I'll read now. It says, uh, so... After Peter got up, it says, when it had dawned on him, when it dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that she just ran, by without, ran without opening the door and said, Peter is at the door. Here's what the people said that were praying for Peter. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that this was so, they said, it must be an angel. But Peter kept knocking, and when they opened the door, they saw him, and they were astonished. They were astonished that the thing they were praying for happened. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet, and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. He said, tell James and the brothers about this, he said, and then he left for another place. This is about expectation. When we pray, we don't just pray to check the box, but we also don't, don't pray just and hope for the best. When we pray, the Lord loves you. He wants to all the best things for you. So when you pray to him, you have to expect that he's going to answer your prayer. When we learn the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, that his will be done, 
was part of our, re our request, meaning that sometimes we pray for stuff we just don't need and don't deserve. And that's not God's will, and fr frankly. But in this particular case, Rhoda, who's only mentioned one time in the Bible for all you Bible historians and intellectuals, there's a trivia question for you. Rhoda, R-H-O-D-A, only mentioned one time in the Bible, and that is in this particular case. So Rhoda hears the knock at the door. She goes, it sounds like Peter. She runs back to tell the people who are standing there praying for him. And what do they do? You're a tripping girl. Peter's, that's not Peter. So then she comes back, she insists, hey, it sounds like Peter. And the word of God says that when they realized it was him, they were astonished. They were blown away. When we pray with expectancy, we're asking the Lord to do something for us that is beyond ourselves. We're asking him to actually deliver on his promise to us. So when you pray, don't just pray and hope for the best. You have to literally pray and, and know that God loves you so much that if it is his will, he's going to make it happen for you. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I'm wrapping here. The four things I want you to remember, and I, if, if I could get my guys to come up real quick, my, all, my small group guys, small group guys. The, the, the four things I want you to remember is that you have to read the word of God, you have to meditate on it, you have to apply it, and then you have to be willing to share it. I just felt like the Lord was calling us today. I know these are not members of the church, but they are members of the church, amen? amen. So, so if there's anybody in this room who, who is so inclined, and you have a special prayer request. I'm asking my brothers to just, to just pray for you really quickly while, during my time, and then I'll pass it back over to Pastor Josh. So here's, here's what I'm asking. If you are a man or a woman, and if you are a woman, I ask that my wife would join in um, to, to, to be available. If you are a man or a woman in this church, and you just need prayer for a basic need, we want to spend a couple of moments of prayer time with you. So can we do that right now? So as I, okay, Gary is so helpful. This is from Matthew eighteen nineteen. It says, again, I see.